Good evening. On behalf of Dr. Carla Hayden, I am delighted to welcome you to the 6th Annual Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film Ceremony. And thank you to the Lucy Black Drumline for that electrifying performance. <laughs> it set just the kind of celebratory mood this occasion deserves. Dr. Hayden is unfortunately unable to join us for tonight, but sends her regards and congratulations to all the filmmakers. The Librarian of Congress plays a central role in the selection of the winning film, and this evening is always a highlight for her. No one can replace her, but it's truly an honor to be here with you tonight. The prize for film was created in 2019 through a partnership between the Library of Congress and the Better Angels Society, a nonprofit organization dedicated to engaging Americans with their history through documentary film. We had a shared vision to highlight and support the very best documentaries that are rooted in archival research and convey the richness of our country's shared past through engaging storytelling. Together with this visionary philanthropist, Jeannie and Jonathan Levine, whose generous support makes this prize possible, <laughs> and the extraordinary filmmaker, Ken Burns, We developed this prize because we all believe in the power of documentary films. In their alchemy of deep research and creative storytelling, documentaries bring our past alive in all of its complexity. They encourage us to think about the stories that inform our current moment and to talk to each other about where we are as a country now and how we got here. And they inspire us to imagine new futures. Through the lens of these films, we find common ground understand different perspectives, and ultimately strengthen the ties that bind us as a country. That's the optimism of history. That power, that optimism, is why, is why the Library of Congress exists. This place represents our nation's commitment to preserving and exploring our collective memory. Here at the library, we take the greatest care of the treasures of American history, whether they're iconic documents, rare sound recordings, or stunning works of art and film and we create ways for all Americans to engage with those treasures, to uncover, explore, and tell the stories that are meaningful to them. The prize for film being natural extension of that mission. By recognizing and supporting the work of documentary filmmakers, so many of whom have used the Library of Congress's collections to craft their films, we are ensuring that these stories continue to be discovered and shared. As we celebrate tonight's finalists, I know Dr. Hayden would remind us to be grateful for the vital role that documentary film plays in connecting us to our past and to each other. Now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce a great friend of the Library of Congress, House Democratic Leader, Hakeem Jeffries. Good evening, what an amazing crowd. It's an honor and a privilege to be here at the Library of Congress, certainly to Ryan, uh, to Dr. Hayden, to Senator Romney, uh, to all those distinguished guests who are here in attendance. Uh, I can think of no more fitting place uh, for this tremendous celebration of the future of hope, of optimism, of documentary filmmaking than America's library. Let me also thank the Better Angels Society for all that you do uh, to support documentary filmmakers and their work uh, in sharing and illuminating the stories of the American people. Our story, the American story, of course, is full of triumphs and turbulence, trials and tribulations, but above all else, resilience and exceptionalism. Through it all, through the ups and downs, the highs and lows, the peaks and the valleys of the American journey, documentary filmmakers like the great Ken Burns have been there to capture, contextualize, and comprehensively explain who we are, where we've been, and hopefully help chart a course for where we need to go. It's an honor to be here in the presence of the legendary Ken Burns, who happens to be from Brooklyn. And so we're very proud of that fact. 
and has defined the genre with his unique portrayal of America's ri rich, rugged, yet ultimately resilient history. Ken Burns has helped us contextualize the horrors of slavery, as well as the Civil War, the genius of jazz, and the legacy of America's pastime, Major League Baseball. Thank you, Ken, for your powerful voice and vision. Now, these are, in fact, challenging times here in America and across the world. In many ways, our country is locked in an existential struggle between the forces of democracy and forces of autocracy, forces of freedom and the forces of tyranny, the forces of truth and those of propaganda. But that's why the work of James and John and Usoff and Julia and Diana and Noah and Marlene is so important. So important. Congratulations on this award, on your work, on your brilliance, on your creativity, and your imagination. You are bringing new aspects to the storytelling about the American journey. It is sacred work that helps us understand who we are and imagine a more just and enlightened future. Through your work, standing on the shoulders of Ken Burns, I'm confident that we will have the ability collectively to continue to understand, appreciate, and of course, through your work, tell our story. We will continue to support the Library of Congress, and as members of Congress, Democrats and Republicans, members of the House and the Senate, as represented here tonight, support the powerful medium of documentary filmmaking. Congratulations to the honorees. It's amazing to be here with all of you. Thank you for supporting them and their work. And it is now my honor to yield, as we say here in Washington, D.C., <laughs> to Jonathan Levine, a great American and a great philanthropist, as is his wife, Jeannie, who makes all of this possible. Thank you all. You know, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Leader Jeffries, for those inspiring remarks. Um, I do feel a little bit like at a fancy restaurant when um, between courses, you know, you had two great speakers, you have Hakeem Jeffries and Mitt Romney, and I'm sort of what they call the amuse-bouche. It's sort of, <laughs> it's, it's quite small. Nobody exactly remembers what it was, but everybody takes it because it's included. So um, I will try to be brief. So Mitt Romney, Hakeem Jeffries, and Ken Burns, all speaking at an event in Washington, is the model of leadership we so dearly need and crave in our country at this moment. Leaders, <laughs> leaders who put country first always. What initially drew Jeannie and I to Ken Burns and his work was simply put, meeting him. It was immediately obvious that he was a man who cared deeply about our country, our people, and most of all, facing our truths for good and sometimes not so good in our never-ending journey to create a more perfect union. 32 years ago, I met another person who projected the values of being an engaged citizen, doing what is right when no one is looking, 
and never sacrificing your principles, no matter what the personal cost. He was at Harvard Business School talking about business. But more than any other speaker I saw in my time there, he was really talking to us about living a good and purposeful life. Through a series of unexpected twists and turns, less than a year later, he hired me at Bain Capital and gave me the chance of a lifetime. The man's name was Mitt Romney. There are so many things Jeannie and I have to thank Mitt for, including speaking here tonight. One of the themes of Ken's films is that many great leaders have not been able to also be good people. It is the rare leader that is both a great leader and a good person. That is what I saw in my years working with Mitt and watching his work as governor, senator, and statesman. While I have tried to follow his lead in business, and our standing here tonight is partial proof of our commitment to civil discourse, it is no secret that politically Jeannie and I have engaged on the opposite side of the aisle than Mitt. I don't think he loves it when I tell people that his inspiring me to engage was, more, was one of the great bipartisan services he provided the Democratic Party. <laughs> but he does seem to get a good laugh out of it. More importantly, Mitt has never judged or criticized our choices. Rather, to paraphrase, paraphrase Ted Lasso, he has always been curious about these choices and not judgmental. Finally, we recently had a gathering at the 40th anniversary party for Bain Capital. At a dinner of the original group of partners, we were all unanimous in our appreciation, not just for the start that Mitt gave us, but for what he left behind when he chose to enter public service. The conversation was not about war stories or deals, maybe a little war stories, but rather about our families focusing on lasting positive impact for our people and our investments. The focus was on our business, our leadership in business, and more importantly, in our communities, building off the lessons we learned from it. He taught us, you always must leave something better than you found it. While it has been a difficult time in our country, and especially here in DC, there is no doubt, as Mitt leaves the Senate, consistent with Ken's vision of American history storytelling, Mitt has personally done his best to leave the discourse better than he found it. For that, we owe him a debt of gratitude. Please welcome Senator Mitt Romney. Jonathan and Jeannie, thank you so much. That introduction was extraordinary, and thank you for your commitment to documentary filmmaking, your relationship with Ken Burns. I am uh, starstruck. I mean, Ken Burns. I mean, this is a name I, I know. I've watched uh, his work, um, and uh, it's had an influence. Uh, there may have been some people, by the way, who who were a bit puzzled that, that a documentary filmmaker who is... Uh, looked at history and looked at individuals and character, uh, decided to have a, a, a documentary on the national parks. And it's like, well, what's that got to do with people? But I, I understood, at least I understood for me, maybe not the way Ken intended it, and that is when I was a, a boy, my dad took me and my brother and sisters, mom was part of this as well, took us on a trip across the American West and we went to one national park after another. And as we were driving from park to park, they read from a book by Irving Stone called Men to Match My Mountains. The, uh, the title was taken from a book by uh, a poet, New Hampshire poet named Sam Foss. Uh, and the first few lines go, hopefully I can get them right, give me men to match my mountains, men to match my plains, men with empires in their purpose, and new eras in their brains. That's what the parks meant to my mom and dad, which is you need to understand this is part of the character of who we are as a people. And you'll see it in the mount mountains and the, and the canyons and the greatness of the land that we have been bequeathed. Um, for me, documentaries are about character. They're about great qualities of humanity. Um, when we see the tragedy of war, some look at all the awful things that happen. I'm also drawn to the extraordinary sacrifices of the men and women who have 
fought so uh, profoundly for our freedom and, and, and our prosperity. Uh, I look at our presidents, uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson, uh, Ken did a documentary on him as well, and his vision, I mean, for me, that's what drew me most. I mean, everyone talks about his writing, which was extraordinary, but his vision as to what would come and what would motivate the American people is what struck me. Mark Twain, he did one on Mark Twain. I, 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 for what, what struck me was the, the hyper-awareness of, uh, of Mark Twain, the things he saw that others didn't see, not just the way he ex expressed them and the humor he brought to them, but, but his ability to see what so few did. We're fortunate as a nation to have had extraordinary individuals as our leaders. Um, and you can all think about your favorite president. We, we suffer from time to time terrible policies. We've made awful policy decisions over time and political decisions. But the character of the country has always been he held aloft by the people who've occupied our Oval Office. And that's why for me, people say, well, you know, what's the thing you look for most in the people you, you want to emulate? It's like their character, their integrity, their honesty, their devotion to others, their devotion to causes bigger than themselves. And that's what I see in excellent work that Ken provides to us. And I congratulate those who are being awarded this evening uh, because you follow in that grand tradition. I, I hope that you will continue to share real stories of real people because in those, we learn about the great qualities that make America the hope of the earth. Thanks, Ken, and thank you for this generous introduction. Bye-bye. Good evening, everyone. My name is Catherine Malone France, and I'm the president and CEO of the Better Angels Society. Thank you so, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to Leader Jeffries and Senator Romney for being with us tonight. And while we all miss Dr. Hayden's sparkling presence, the Better Angels Society is grateful to all of our friends at the Library of Congress, and of course to Jeannie and Jonathan Levine for our partnership with you. There is nothing else like this event in DC or anywhere else. There's also nothing else like the Better Angels Society. Our mission is to support excellence in American history documentaries in ways that advance education and civic engagement. And no other organization is solely focused on this important work at a national scale. So to share more about why our work matters, let's hear from some members of our community and see a sampling of some of the films we've supported through our programs. What documentary film does is make history a living part of our collective memory. The thing where you just shake your head and you go, I had no idea. That's the only response that really matters to me. It's so important to share stories that haven't been told by adding to that tapestry of American history. We have a fuller picture. Because of the support of the Better Angels Society, we're able to tell large, diverse, complicated stories. In 2019, the Better Angel Society and the Library of Congress created the Library of Congress Levine Ken Burns Prize for Film. And since that time, the prize has become a real bellwether for documentary filmmaking. The Better Angels Society has grown to become an important figure in the world of documentary, not only helping filmmakers make their films, we're able to create a community in which we feel that we're helping each other, that a rising tide lifts all boats, and that rising tide is the Better Angels Society. When you become a Better Angels Levine Fellow, you get a grant, you have mentorship, you have editorial support, and then of course, you also get fellowship to be able to have conversations with like-minded people who have gone through the same situation and share experiences. 
through the next generation angels, you get a chance to meet the kids that are up and coming and being able to help them, being able to offer things, being able to hear in their questions the same questions that not only I had, but I still have. Programs like this really help build that next generation of filmmakers because of these opportunities that they provide. Things from meeting renowned filmmakers and having your documentary shown in front of a sea of people. It's something you really just can't find anywhere else. I'm thrilled to share the stage with three great American history documentarians, Jay Patel, Abigail Giraud, and Kim Burns. When I started creating my film, my main goal was to share a story. And so being able to have 800 people know the legacy of such an untold part of American history. It's such an amazing thing. The thing that I've noticed among the many people who've supported us uh, through the Better Angels Society is how excited they feel and how much they feel heard and part of a process. There's a long line of filmmakers who have yet to finish projects, who have yet to come up with ideas for projects, who have yet to be born. What are we doing here? Let's keep this thing going. Leo Tolstoy said that art was the transfer of emotion from one person to the other. This is a higher emotion that I think liberates us all and makes us feel part of a bigger community. And that is a privileged space to be in and I would not be able to practice in that space the way I have been able to without the Better Angel Society. Come and join us. Thank you. As I hope you just saw, we want to make sure that the filmmakers who tell our shared stories are recognized and supported wherever they are along their journey, ensuring that we always have brilliant documentarians who look like America to tell our stories. Thank you to all our partners who helped us tell our story in that film. The Library of Congress, Florentine Films, GBH American Experience, WNET American Masters, and all the filmmakers who made time to be in our film. We hope that everyone here will join us in this work, so look for more information from us after tonight about how you can do just that. Now, I wanna take a moment to recognize all of our wonderful sponsors who have made this event possible. Thank you. I especially want to acknowledge our presenting sponsor, Bank of America, one of the most stalwart supporters of outstanding American history documentaries, including those by Ken Burns. Thank you again to all of our sponsors. We are also supported at the prize by film, prize for film, <laughs> by an honorary committee of acclaimed leaders from across the media and cultural landscape, each of them a powerful storyteller in their own right. They represent the creativity, scholarship, and public engagement and artistry that is recognized by the prize. Thank you. We are honored by your engagement with us. And now, it is my great honor to introduce a man who really needs no introduction, especially here. He is an artist, a scholar, a storyteller, and a patriot. Ladies and gentlemen, Ken Burns. Thank you, Catherine. Good evening, and a huge thank you to the Library of Congress for hosting us this evening again and for your continued partnership. I miss my dear friend, Dr. Carla Hayden, but we'll somehow soldier on without her. The work of the Library of Congress truly tends to the soul of our country, and my work would not be possible without yours. I have spent countless hours here combing through your collections for research and for inspiration. Early in my career, I'd come camera in hand with two scoop lights and set up old black and white photographs from the Matthew Brady collection on easels so that we could film them eight straight weeks, 8.30 in the morning till five at night. I think the Ken Burns effect was born at the Library of Congress, <laughs> whatever that is. 
we've used the extraordinary resources of the library and now the digital library, very important for nearly every film. The technologies that allow us to preserve and share our history continue to change and the library continues to evolve with them. But this place remains, this place remains an irreplaceable locus of knowledge and memory and a bulwark of our democracy. Democracy, I often think, is dependent on our ability to remember. And remembering requires that we also collect stuff, things. Thank you again to the Library of Congress. Thank you to my dear friends, Jeannie and Jonathan Levine, who understand the immense power of history. We would not be here today without your generosity and transformative support. Thanks also to Bank of America, who has been my sole corporate underwriter since 2006. They are beyond enlightened, and the fact that they've joined us here in this exercise shows their ongoing commitment way beyond our work to other developing filmmakers, and we're so grateful. And thank you to the board and staff of the Better Angel Society for all you do to make the prize for film happen and support excellence in American historical documentaries in so many ways. Thanks especially to board member Meredith DeWitt, who is here somewhere. There she is. For her leadership in creating and growing the prize for film and to the newest Better Angels, Peter and Lindsay Snell, for their support of this event. Being part of this prize is a great privilege, and I want to thank a host of others who bring their time and expertise to this effort. So many top-notch, carefully researched, amazing documentaries are submitted every year, and each is evaluated as part of an extensive jury process. Our internal review committee, who you can see in your program, is comprised of filmmakers from Florentine Films and historians from the Library of Congress who narrow the massive number of selections down to the top six. Those are then shared with our esteemed national jury, which selects the top two. This year's national jury was chaired by Dr. Carla Hayden and included historians Dr. David G. Gutierrez, Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, and Dr. Claudio Sant. It also included award-winning documentarians Juliana Branham, Sam Pollard, and Betsy West, along with Jacqueline Glover, former senior vice president of HBO Documentary Films and currently the executive director of Harvard University's Black Film Project. We could not be more grateful for your time and thoughtfulness in selecting the top two films. The winner is then selected by Dr. Hayden, in consultation with me. She always wins whatever she wants. <laughs> now, without further ado, the moment everyone has been waiting for, it's time to honor the six best American history documentaries of 2024 and announce afterwards the winner and runner-up. Let's roll the clip. It's called Area 2. And for nearly two decades, it was the epicenter for what has been described as the systematic torture of dozens of African-American males by Chicago police officers. Are you aware there have been numerous judicial findings over the years that there was a pattern and practice of beatings up to and including torture by John Burge and people under his supervision? Absolutely. Do you dispute that that happened? Not for a second. Are you aware of anyone from Cook County State's Attorney's Office, a three year tenure, whoever went to the FBI, the United States Attorney's Office, or a disinterested law enforcement agency to try to put a halt to these practices? If we knew at the time what we know now, things may have been different. This may be the largest police scandal in the United States in the last half century. My name is Andrew Carroll. I'm the founding director of the Center for American War Letters. These letters had secrets to reveal. They show us the beating heart of history. That paper is an extension of somebody. And there's a connection. There's a tangible connection. 
Dear Helen, you say that you wish you were over here. Although most people think that they are war conscious, how can they be? Their knowledge is facts of the mind. Mine is the war-torn body, scared to soul's depth. Someone said, why letters? They're kind of the world's great undiscovered literature. It captures the essence of that person. They fell in love through letters. I try not to count the days until I see you, worlds apart and yet together. These are moments which should never be lost. Just think of all these millions of letters that are still out there. You never know what you're going to find. The Fleischers are really an American story. The humor of the Fleischers cartoon is really their biggest secret weapon. It was hysterically funny by just their attitude. They really gave uh, Disney a run for his money. Insane and totally experimental films. It still feels ahead of its time. Just blew the top of my head off. They were in the same oeuvre with Salvador Dali. The Fleischer stuff just felt weird, man. It was weird. It's a great rise of people coming together, and then it was over. Advantages of running a family business is that it's family, and the disadvantages is that it's family. There was just too much conflict in personality style. There's no greater hate than brotherly love. Dory Previn once told an interviewer, she said, I died in this album and came back to life. And it all came about as a result, I understand, a Dory of a doctor handling you a typewriter and saying right. When I was in a hospital, um, I didn't uh, want to make baskets and belts, yet you have to do therapy. He suggested that I uh, write about what I was thinking and feeling. Give me your junkie. I thought I would write it in the only craft I know, which is the lyric form. Symbol of dreams turns out to be a sign of disillusion. Maybe I am bizarre to some people, but I'm not all that bizarre. The largest children's theater in the world, it turns out, is in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. Children's theater was a national gem. It was the most magical, unbelievable place where things happened that you could only see in fairy tales. Now I look back at it and I'm horrified. We are about creating sacred moments and magic. Part of what made it so special is John Clark Donahue. He was teaching us always, introducing us to art. Our minds were being expanded. I heard the rumors about John Donahue. I sensed this erratic energy for danger. The Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension investigated complaints that students were being sexually abused. You were looking at a tip of the iceberg. Denial is such an easy thing to choose. Institutions make themselves complicit in the hope that these problems will go away, that these memories will go away, that this history will go away. That's not going to happen. In 1964, Mississippi, it was the most oppressive climate for African Americans in the South. There was so much hate in the air, so much bitterness. I was afraid all the time that I was there. We could not make any kind of announcement. We had to keep it very quiet. We have very few pictures, and so it had to be woman to woman. These are women who met behind the scenes to try to build bridges of understanding between white and black women. 
but they met behind closed doors. And for that reason, you don't know who they are. Congratulations to each of our finalists. They are all amazing films. Tonight we are awarding a $200,000 cash prize to the winning film, a $50,000 cash prize to the runner-up, and $25,000 each to the four finalists. You don't have any idea when you're finishing a film what it is like to be able to get that time code off or to get that watermark off and to finally be able to see the footage you've been working with for two or three or four years finally the way it should be seen and in many cases the difference between working on a film and completing a film has been the Levine Prize and we're so grateful. I'd like to, in fact to invite Jeannie and Jonathan Levine to join me on stage as we announce the runner-up and winner of this year's prize. Jeannie, Jeannie, would you like to share a few thoughts before announcing the runner-up, just to torture people a little bit longer? I would love to. <laughs> thank you, Ken. Um, but before I begin, I just want to take one moment um, to thank our dear friend, Meredith DeWitt. Um, Meredith introduced us to Ken Burns. <laughs> Meredith introduced us to Ken Burns 14 years ago, and we are just so grateful. And Meredith is also the superpower behind this prize for film. And I just want to acknowledge you before I say anything else. Um, <laughs> the prize for film means so much to Jonathan and me because it brings together people and organizations that are important to us and to our country. I was one of the founding board members of the Better Angel Society, helping to establish its vital mission, and I am so proud of how its programs and impacts have grown. And we are so grateful for our longtime friendship with you, Ken. We have a deep appreciation for your process and your singular storytelling. In films like The Vietnam War and The U.S. and the Holocaust, Ken explores the best and the worst of our history with a balanced approach and a deep commitment to truth. We are, we are so looking forward to his upcoming film on the American Revolution that is going to be such an important moment for this country to come together and explore our national origin story in all of its complexities and its contradictions. Outstanding historical documentaries like those made by Ken and the filmmakers we are celebrating tonight don't shy away from stories that are difficult and painful. They portray them truthfully, informed by the kind of deep research that is only made possible by institutions like the Library of Congress. In doing so, they create a space for us all to learn and to acknowledge and to find a way forward. In that spirit, I am honored to announce the 2024 runner-up for the Library of Congress, Levine Ken Bird's Prize for Film, is Magic and Monsters, directed by Nora Shapiro. <laughs> Nora. Okay, um, in the absence of Dr. Hayden, who would normally be uh, performing this extraordinary task, I am delighted to announce that this year's winner is Cartooning America, directed by Aesop Gulai. Aesop, would you join us on the stage?
I'm pleased to moderate a short panel discussion with um, Asif and Ken. But before I do that, one of the things that Ken talked about in his remarks is this prize has become more than the one, two, or up to six people who have received awards, but a real community. And Jeannie and I and Ken were all heartened to see uh, you know, several, a dozen people probably in the audience tonight who are previous winners, finalists, next generation fellows. And um, we are just so excited you are all here today because in many ways that's more important than the prize in any single year. And if this continues to become a community that um, passes on from generation to generation, all that Ken has tried to do, um, it will have accomplished a lot. So thank you all for being here. Um, so, Asif, before um, I ask the first question, um, we're going to pull up a short clip of, from the film. Things we think of when we think of Popeye are really the Max Fleischer cartoons, the Dave Fleischer cartoons. Dave came out of the streets in New York and he was more of a street smart kid than Max and the other brother were not. Here, you two little skilly wax. <laughs> now, what's this? This way to the preserved seats, cause what we need is brother. Some of the animators were also New Yorkers, and that would include Dick Humor. Dick Humor came from the streets just like Dave did, and they once talked about their childhoods and realized that they were present at the same gang fight. Do you think the, uh, or the tough guys that you saw when you were a kid had anything to do with the tough guy humor that was always in the Popeye cartoons? Oh, well, I'm pretty sure of that, because uh, when I lived in Brownsville and at Fulton Street were a different crowd of people, different nationalities, and you always have fights, guns, sticks. But across the street was a candy store with a lot of gangs in there. And we used to hang out with the gangs. And they thought I was a, a tough guy because I used to wrestle with them. And they used to call me tough, but when I got into a fight, I found out that I wasn't that tough. That's <laughs> what we need is brother Layla. Why don't you? Let me suck that guy. Let me suck. Come on, give me that club. Here, give me that club. Either side. No cards, please. Part of the reason why Popeye was as successful as he was is because he was a pipsqueak. He's up against this big giant brute, this woman who towers over him. But Popeye is our hero, and. He's an underdog. So when I was growing up uh, watching old Popeye cartoons on Channel 27 in Boston, I never imagined uh, I'd be in the auditorium at the Library of Congress. Um, so, uh, Asif, as I understand it, the um, archival footage that here that we saw comes from the library's collections. How'd you find it, and how'd you think about it, and how does it fit into your film more broadly? So, this rare footage of New York, it's coming from the Library of Congress. It's a documentary film called In the Streets, made uh, by a photographer. Her name is Helen Levid. And it's very rare to find this. And you can see in this footage, and also in the Popeye footage, uh, later the cartoon, you can see people with different skin color, that it's very rare. And uh, in Disney film, he raised the race. But here in the Fleischer, they put the cartoons, they put the, the different ethnicity and Dave was part of these gangs. Maybe he was not the hero. I think he was the peep squeak. 
but he could make laugh of it. And it's a great because it's a bonding laugh between all this tension. And this is, I think, what makes the flash of humor so great. Can I just add a of course. thing I just <laughs> learned just now? Yes. So I knew Helen Levitt. My mentor, Jerome Liebling, a still photographer, was close to Helen Levitt. His style is very similar to hers. And when I watched this, because there's no credits and there's none of the things, we're an unfinished film, I had no idea, but there was a kind of um, familiarity to it that, that helped me bond em emotionally to it. And, you know, there's, uh, there's a wonderful lineage now. We're connected by Helen Levitt and her work. And in the streets, if you ever have a chance, come here to look at it. It is one of the great documentary films of just life at that particular time in the streets of New York, late 40s and early 50s. Wow. Um, the Fleischer, so Ken, for you, the Fleischer brothers um, not only obviously created um, groundbreaking animations, but also reflected, and uh, as Asif talked about a little bit, um, and influenced American culture during their time. How do you see their work fitting into the broader narrative of American history? And what parallels do you see with other historical figures you've explored? Well, I think the important thing here is that we tend to, in our crowded world, we tend to develop a kind of conventional wisdom about what took place, or what something stands for, or what, say, cartoons mean. And in our country, it means Walt Disney. And then you maybe can go into Chuck Jones and the Warner Brothers Looney Tunes and have the Roadrunner and, and Bugs Bunny. But I, th I think what, what the great genius of this film is is that it has, it has gone down a few levels and found this complex, incredibly fraught family dynamic that is nonetheless producing this really raw and interesting and revelatory a bit of popular art in the cartoon business. And so what I think it always reminds me is that every time you think that, say, American history is just the sequence of presidential administrations punctuated by wars, you have neglected the entire bottom-up story, not to put them at the bottom, but to put them at a top, but ones that usually are selected out. And I, I love the fact that what these documentary filmmakers are doing in all the film is they are diving down beneath the surface and willing to tolerate the, the controversy and the contradictions that may be inherent in the story and not just accept the sort of the anodyne version that we're usually presented with, in this case, what a cartoon in America means, you know, which is whoop, whoop. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you do that again? <laughs> um, so while everybody knows characters like Betty Boop and Popeye and their fixtures of American culture, you know, I want to talk a little bit about inspiration. So the story of the Fleischer brothers is in many ways until this and continues to be unknown. Why is it so important and how do you get the inspiration to fully excavate stories like this for both of you? Uh, Growing up, I watched uh, the Disney, like every kid around the world, but uh, I couldn't relate it to it. Uh, I, when I was seven years old, I saw Popeye, and it was a revelation to me. <laughs> of course, I was seven years old, I didn't know that it's a revelation. So, <laughs> just later as a filmmaker, I started to think more what was driving me to this to the cartoons. I think the Disney cartoon, it's the same beauty, it's uh, the masculine, people are square, and I like the Fleischer cartoons. People are weird. <laughs> <laughs> Popeye mumbles, uh, olive oil, she's stretched out, Betty Boop, she has a huge head. <laughs> Also, I think that as me as an outsider kid, I, I, I found myself in these cartoons. Uh, in this moment, I can see myself also as a Fleischer character. <laughs> I have a very heavy accent in uh, English. <laughs> that could be something that the Fleischer can do, can 
laugh about it, and this is great. You can laugh about your weirdness. This is part of what the Fleischer wants to say to us. I think that's exactly right. I, I think that, you know, and I'm, I agree completely. I was a Popeye guy, I still eat spinach. Uh, it, it hasn't worked for me, but it, it, it's worked, it's worked for, for Popeye. But I think that we are always to our peril and detriment sanitize the past. And I think that we have to understand that as much as we talk about the divisions between people, between a red state and blue state, between the Senate and the House, between you know gay and straight, young and old, Palestinian and Israeli, we forget that those divisions exist within us too and that we are uh, torn. And I think the great artists have always reflected this. And I think the film points to that. And I think the, there's an anarchic and confusing character to all of these people that appeals to a part of us and part of our own explorations and discoveries in film and I think I'm speaking for all the filmmakers here not just you that it's always the weird is part of it and and understanding the just amazing contradictions and undertow that attend to any subject once you've penetrated the surface once you've said you're not going to accept that kind of conventional wisdom about it and I just want to touch on one last thing you I've heard you make the joke correctly that when you were a very young man, not that you're not now, um, you sold people to Brooklyn Bridge yes. um, and, uh, and uh, turned out to be uh, one of the most amazing films. When you think about the dozens of films you've done, what's the most unlikely place you think you found in We were like, you know, I went from the Brooklyn Bridge to doing people to doing the parks to, you know, is there any one where you said, this will never be a film, and then it turned into complete inspiration and something you wanted to do. Um, yeah, that happens all the time, Jonathan, and, it, and it's interesting, and I think both Leader Jeffries and Senator Romney addressed this. There's something in the water here, and we often hide our light under a bushel, deliberately. We often succumb to tendencies that are not helpful, in this country, but somehow the two oceans have incubated in us some incredible curiosity, incredible work ethic, and incredible creativity. And so what happens is that almost every story in American history that you approach, you go, well, I don't, and then all of a sudden, it just beckons you in. And I'm always really surprised at the profundity, the depth, uh, and the complexity of, of the subjects that we do, and so you end up not having to regurgitate some kind of familiar trope, but get um, the way Asaf has to the unbelievable heart of this complex family drama that is producing great art. And that's, it's just an amazing accomplishment. And it's true of all the films that we saw. This is a Sophie's Choice situation that Dr. Hayden has and that I have at, at, at the very end of this process because any one of these films could be there. And we hope that some of them will be able to, to take the money and come back another year and, you know, show us what you've got. And, and it's really wonderful to find out that in subsequent years, this got broadcast on public broadcast, American Masters, and my friend Michael Cantor is here tonight, was able to help and work with them and it's, it's on or they're found distribution and that's what we want to do is just figure out a way in which we can um, expand the possibility and the reach of these films. And um, this is a perfect example. Wonderful. Congratulations. Um, Thank you so much. Um, as we return to our seats, it's a pleasure to welcome Catherine back on stage. Um, and then it says on my cards, end. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan and Ken and Asaf for that fascinating conversation. So let's end tonight by looking forward. The Better Angels Society is also helping to build 
the next generations of American history documentarians, representing the full richness of our country and telling the stories that are meaningful to these young people in their own unique voices. Now, you met a few of our student filmmakers already in our short film. They are recipients of our Next Generation Angels Awards made possible through the generous support of Jessica and John Fullerton and in partnership with our friends at National History Day. We're honored. <laughs> we are honored to have some of these student filmmakers here tonight and I am delighted to share just a short sampling of the 2024 winning films around the theme of turning points in history. In 1990, the American Disabilities Act, ADA, was passed into law, prohibiting discrimination against disabled Americans and protecting their basic rights to access public buildings, telecommunications, transportation, and employment. Much like previous civil rights movements, the ADA gained support through protests, congressional lobbying, and negotiations with politicians. The passage of the ADA was a turning point in how Americans with disabilities were treated, and a landmark law affirming the inherent dignity of America's largest minority group. Seeing people invoke their Miranda rights in TV, movies, and today's social media has been crucial to ensuring that people are aware of their rights. Miranda in pop culture was so important that a 2000 Supreme Court case trying to overturn Miranda failed because Miranda was embedded in the national culture and next to the Pledge of Allegiance and Familiarity, as Chief Justice William Rehnquist put it. Effectively striking down the 1968 omnibus law, the 2000 decision expanded Miranda by requiring interrogators to read the warning to suspects in both federal and state courts. The Congo was rich in high-quality uranium, an essential element in making atomic bombs. The U.S. already had covert uranium mines during World War II, and throughout the Cold War went to great lengths to keep the USSR out of the Congo, as both sides saw uranium as a source of power. Throughout the Congolese independence movement, Lumumba was against foreign powers mining his country's uranium, adding to the list of reasons the U.S. sought his replacement. As foreign pressure mounted, Lumumba worked 18 hours daily to prevent his newly independent country from collapsing. However, his unwillingness to negotiate with other politicians added to the growing tensions in the Congolese government. Throughout time, rivers have been influential in shaping society. Most of them have shaped history by flowing water, but very few have molded history the way the Cuyahoga River did. It influenced history by burning. Although the Cuyahoga River in Cleveland, Ohio had burned before, due to growing environmental awareness and increased political action, the timely fire on June 22, 1969 generated a turning point for change in protecting national water quality. When Sesame Street debuted on November 10th, 1969, audiences loved it. Positive reviews were shared as both children and parents alike were amazed at how a show could educate children, making it a turning point in children's television. In 1979, a New York Times article by Edith Spiegel wrote, parents get a vicarious thrill showing off preschoolers who can recite the alphabet. Halfway through the first season, Sesame Street's public parents, daycare center teachers, station managers acting on behalf of the children began persistently asking if the show would be renewed. In the first two months of airing, Sesame Street was viewed in 14 million households across the country. So when we think of the young people and the children's march of 1963, I think one of the things that we have to open our eyes to is just how impossible change would have seemed in Birmingham in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And 
even though it seemed impossible, those young people fought for it anyway. Next Generation Angels, can you please stand or wave to be recognized? As you can see, the future of historical documentaries is bright. At the Better Angels Society, we're so committed to uplifting the next generation of storytellers that we created the Amy Marjoram Berg Fund, honoring our President Emerita, to expand our work in this area. Our partnership with National History Day has grown to include mentorships for the winners of both the individual and the group documentary competitions and we look forward to finding more ways to showcase their work. And new this year, we're also supporting the Lincoln Presidential Foundation's latest generation film contest. Right now, all across the Midwest, high school and college students are taking part in free online mentoring workshops led by experienced filmmaker, public media professionals, and historians, all designed to strengthen their artistic, historical, and critical thinking skills. They'll use this new knowledge to create short films focused on the theme on this land, telling stories from the histories of their own neighborhoods and communities. We cannot wait to share them with you next year. But you know, programs like these aren't just about the films themselves. As these students make their films, they uncover different points of view on a topic, they critically analyze sources, they place events into context and they weave multiple perspectives into a larger narrative. All skills that are essential for the citizens of a healthy democracy. Doc <laughs> True enough. Documentaries about our history, whether they are made by students or established or emerging filmmakers, are so important to the health of our society not only because they're a way of telling our stories, but also because they are a way of listening to each other's stories, showing respect for each other's achievements, challenges, and resilience. Thank you for being here tonight and for listening to the stories of all of these talented filmmakers. Let's give one more round of applause to all our filmmakers. If you share our belief in the power of outstanding American history documentaries and their ability to strengthen the fabric of our country, the Better Angels Society will be following up with you in the next few days. And as Ken said earlier in the film, please join us in this incredibly important work, telling our stories and listening to each other's stories. And now it is my pleasure to welcome back to the stage Ken Burns to say just a few last words. Thank you, Catherine. This evening we celebrated how documentary filmmaking deepens our understanding of the past and inspires the future. Our shared history is a source of strength, wisdom, and hope. If you would like to see more of this year's winning film, Cartooning America, please come back for the free series live at the library on October 10th to screen part of the film. Both Asof and Catherine will be here for that conversation. Thank you to everyone for being here tonight. Experiencing these stories, talking about them together only magnifies their impact. Now I invite you to continue the conversation with us at a dessert my favorite word, reception in the Great Hall. We hope to see you next year. Good night.